Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is David Bagdasarian, and I'm a corporate partner in the Miami office and co-chair of the firm-wide Differently Able Task Force at K&L Gates. On behalf of the firm-wide Diversity Committee, welcome to our 12th speaker in our series on race and diversity. And on behalf of the entire K&L Gates community, we also welcome our clients who have joined us today for this very important conversation. The firm launched a firm-wide speaker series in June 2020 in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd to have conversations focused on the effects of systemic racism in our society as part of our pledge to listen, be educated, take action, and work together to build a more equitable and inclusive society. We have heard from numerous distinguished speakers through this program, including Derek Johnson, President and CEO of NAACP, Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr., civil rights leader, revered teacher and mentor, and Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, author, historian, and grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. Since then, with the immense success of the program, we have broadened our scope to encompass diversity and inclusion topics outside of race, as well as jurisdictions beyond the United States, and have renamed our series Conversations About Race and Diversity. Over the past year, we have heard from Kevin Jennings, CEO of Lambda Legal, who discussed America's fight for LGBTQ plus equality, and Justice Mary Yu, who spoke about her intersectionality as the first Asian, Latina, and out member of the LGBTQ plus community to serve on the Washington State Supreme Court in August. Now, in celebration of International Day of Persons with Disabilities, which was observed this past Saturday on December 3. It is my pleasure to welcome our guest, the Honorable Tony Coelho, and my co-chair of the firm-wide Differently Able Task Force, Craig Lean, Labor, Employment, and Workplace Safety Partner in our DC office and moderator of today's conversation. I am pleased to announce the task force worked with the firm-wide Diversity Committee to bring our first Differently Abled speaker to our series. Tony is a six-term congressman from California and primary author and sponsor of the American with Disabilities Act of 1990, otherwise known as the ADA. Please join me in welcoming Craig and Tony. Thank you, David. It's such a pleasure to be here today as part of this important series that k &L Gates has been doing. And today we have another tremendous installment in that series with Tony. Um, you know, I've known Tony for, for quite a while, um, in the disability community as a disability advocate. And, and Tony really is the hero to many people in the disability community as an advocate and someone who has devoted his life and what he calls it his, his mission, his ministry, uh, to uh, serving individuals with disabilities, to making sure that people with disabilities have a fair shot and are fully included in the economy, in the workforce, in all aspects of life. So it's such a pleasure to be here today with Tony let me just say a couple other points about Tony's background, and then we'll get to the, the, the main part of today's discussion. Uh, Tony was House Majority Whip in 1986. He was appointed by President Bill Clinton uh, to serve as chairman of the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, a position he held from 1994 to 2001. He also served as vice chair of the National Task Force on Employment of Adults with Disabilities. And as was mentioned, he's the primary author of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about that today. And then on a personal note, uh, when I served as director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFCCP, at the US Department of Labor, and wanted to uh, develop a focused review program that focused on Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act, uh, the, the person I went to was Tony. We had, I remember uh, we talked several times and we, we, we had a get together and I got a lot of helpful advice from him and that advice was extraordinarily useful in putting together a program where OFCCP focused on federal contractors and making sure that they were fully including people with disabilities in all aspects of employment. And I'll tell you, it was a very popular program and it's something that I'll be forever grateful. That probably the thing I'm proudest of in my career and I owe a lot of that to Tony. So it's personally a pleasure to be here today. Welcome Tony. Hi, hi Tony, how are you doing today? For those comments, appreciate it very much. It's great to be here with you. So let, let's get to it. So, you know, in, in uh, 2020, 
It was the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. You are also you are often credited as being the primary author. You're also very humble about that. And you mentioned all the different people who were involved in the ADA, the bipartisan effort. But could you talk a little bit about the ADA? Um, why 1990? Um, what was it about that date where everything came together, where such a significant civil rights a piece of civil rights legislation could be enacted for people with disabilities? And could you talk a little bit about uh, what led up to that and and looking forward to engaging on the ADA today? Thank you, Greg. Well, let me start off with why I got involved. I think that might be interesting to people. When I was 16, I had a, an, a pickup truck accident on my family's dairy farm hit my head and uh, there was nothing wrong with that. And a year later in the barn milking and uh, all of a sudden I woke up and I was in my bed. I had had a seizure and had passed out in the barn. My brother carried me to the house. Um, I didn't know it was a seizure. I just knew that I passed out and doctor came out and talked to my parents and, and uh, my parents said he didn't know. Uh, but later I found out, of course, that he told them that I had epilepsy. My family felt, uh, because of their background, uh, Portuguese Americans, Catholic, and so forth, that if you had epilepsy, you were possessed by the devil. Now, I always say at this point that my Republican friends know I'm possessed, but having your family think you're possessed is a little bit different. Uh, so then we went to two other doctors, and they basically said the same thing. Doctors in those days uh, didn't talk to the patient. They talked to my, my family. And so then my family then took me to uh, witch doctors. So I went to three witch doctors. And, and of course, they didn't uh, get rid of these evil spirits or whatever was going on. Um, and I just keep, kept on having my passing out spells. I went on to college at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And uh, I did well there, and I was had my passing out spells, and everything was fine. And then I decided to uh, become a, a Catholic priest. Loyola is a Jesuit university, and um, and so upon graduating, I uh, entered. I was going to enter the seminary and had my physical, and the doctor said to me, uh, "Have you ever heard the word epilepsy?" And I said, "No." And he says, "Well, it's what you have." I can prescribe medication to help you and the seizures, I can't cure it, but I can help you. And the the bad news, is, the good news is it's your 4F and you won't serve in the military. This was 1964, right in the middle of Vietnam. The bad news is that the Catholic Church in 400 AD uh, said that if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. And so I was denied entry, but I was, happy because all of a sudden I knew what these passing out spells were and I was going to get a prescription to help me out and so forth and so on. I ended up, uh, when I left that uh, doctor's office, I called my parents to say, you know, I'm uh, good news. I know what my problem is. I have epilepsy. And my parents said, no son of ours has epilepsy. And that began uh, the whole thing I talk about a lot about stigma and that my family felt um, that I was possessed or that whatever. And, and, uh, and so it began a separation with me and my family. Uh, I then uh, had a lot of job offers. And so I then uh, started going to these places for the interview and filling out the application. The word epilepsy was on it. And uh, I marked it, of course, but I never got an interview after going to many of these places and rejected every time, I started drinking and I was drunk by two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And I was doing this on a mountaintop, uh, when you're drunk, it's a mountain, it actually was a hill, on a mountaintop in Los Angeles, California. And the day that I was going to do the dirty deed, um, uh, I all of a sudden I saw a merry-go-round at the bottom of the hill and uh, I heard a voice that said, you're going to be just like those little kids. You're never going to let anything or anybody stop you from doing what you want to do. I got my mojo back. Um, I all of a sudden, I've never had another 
a, a, a period of depression. I've never, I still drink, but not, I don't get drunk. Um, but I just felt good about myself again. And a priest friend of mine uh, ended up uh, setting me up to live with Bob Hope and his family. Now, some of you are too young to know who Bob Hope is, but he's a famous TV comedian. comedian. And But I lived with uh, the family for a year. And Mr. Hope at one point said to me, he says, you know, your problem is you think you have a ministry and it only can be practiced in a church. A true ministry is practiced in sports, entertainment, government, business, uh, but you belong in politics. Now, Mr. Hope is a very conservative Republican and I'm a Democrat, but that didn't stop him and didn't stop me. I wrote a letter to my congressman who I didn't know, got a job, worked for him for 14 years. But I realized during that period of time that there were a lot of things going on in regards to disabilities where those of us with disabilities didn't have our basic civil rights. And so when he retired, I ran for his seat, got elected, and I promised my constituents that I would do anything they needed in regards to agriculture or water uh, from Central California, and that's a big issue there. But I said that on social issues, um, I wanted to do what I thought was right, and I would educate. And so I started looking at uh, the disabilities, what was going on. And I realized that if you were in a, a, a chair, a wheelchair, and you went into a movie theater, you could be night entry. If you were in a restaurant and you asked the, the waiter to read the menu for you, they could kick you out as a nuisance. And all of a sudden, I realized that all these things were in effect legal. You could not take any action. So I started thinking about how do I correct that? And so I started talking to uh, President Reagan's staff people, and uh, they were working on this. And so I uh, started working on the ADA. And so that was my motivation, is try to correct what was going on. And so uh, I then introduced it uh, in the House of Representatives. And in the Senate, it was introduced by a, a group of folks, really prominent people, uh, such as Bob Dole, who was the Republican leader at the time, uh, who had a disability. Uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, sort of the the guru in the Senate. He was respected by both sides of the aisle, had, had uh, a son with a disability and a sister with a disability and was very committed. And Tom Harkin, who had a brother with a disability. And Orrin Hatch, uh, who had a family member with a disability, very conservative Republican, um, Mormon who felt that in the Mormon church that if you had a disability, you were a child of God. And so that was the group in the Senate who really pushed and got it through. And I always say that if we didn't have that type of leadership, we would have never got it through the Senate. On the House side, I was majority whip and I was in the leadership, of course. And so I pushed it hard. Um, the, some people in the leadership felt that it was too big of legislation, too broad and that we should break it up and so on, felt that the public would react negatively. Uh, because of my position, I was elected uh, a Democratic whip, just like the speaker or the majority leader. And I said, no, that I felt it had to be together and, and we worked on it. And the person most responsible for getting it done was Congressman Steny Hoyer uh, from Maryland. Uh, when I left the Congress, he took it over and he did a masterful job in getting it through the House um, and so then we're now 32 years later, and it's now the law of the land in about 52 different countries besides the United States, and it has had an impact, and I'm happy to talk to Greg more about that. That'd be great. Actually, let me ask you at this point, you know, um, Dick Thornburg, who was Attorney General at the time, and who you know, um, and he passed away a couple of years ago, he was a partner at this firm for many years, and I recently went to a a memorial service for him and a very prominent part of his career was and, and probably the part he was most proud of was his work on the americans with disabilities act um could, could you speak a little bit about your relationship with dick and his role yeah dick and jenny his wife were very close friends of mine um and dick played a major role he was attorney general for papa bush as i call him uh president bush and 
uh, as attorney general, he pushed the White House in regards to going along with the ADA. Uh, the chief of staff, John Sununu, uh, was adamantly opposed, said it was too broad and so forth. And he was recommending to the president to veto. Uh, Dick uh, basically was pushing hard for the president to support it and so forth. And his wife, Jenny, uh, was very active uh, with uh, the disability community and trying to get religious groups to accept uh, what the whole effort was on the ADA. So that Dick and Jenny both were a critical part of our success. And uh, Dick was extremely well respected uh, in the political world, but uh, especially uh, respected among the Republican Party. And that was critical for us in getting this legislation through. A wonderful, wonderful man. Thank you, Tony. Let me let me ask you this. You know, the you've talked about on both the Republican side and the Democratic side, uh, coming together to adopt this landmark legislation. And it's, it's, a, it's a piece of legislation that is balanced in many ways. There's a, obviously it's a, it's a civil rights, piece of civil rights legislation for people with disabilities. And at the same time, there, there are balances in there, uh, concepts like undue hardship, reasonable accommodation. Um, can you talk a little bit about reaching those compromises, uh, the thought that went into that and and also maybe, you know, today, a lot of times, and I know people are always saying politicians used to get along better back in the day, but it does seem like this is a fairly divisive time in our uh, country's politics. Could you talk a little bit about bipartisanship as well? Sure. Um, part of the legislation is that on accommodations, we said it had to be economically feasible. And that was a term of law that was never established before. But basically what we were trying to say is that if you were a small business and somebody in a wheelchair had to use a desk and the desk was too low for the chair to get underneath, you could put uh, a piece of two by four under each of the legs, lift up the desk, and that would be a reasonable accommodation. Now, if you were a major corporation, that wasn't a reasonable accommodation. You had to provide for uh, total access. So. We, we were conscious of the fact that we didn't want to hurt small business, but we wanted everybody to participate in some way. And so that was one of the uh, things we did. Secondly, uh, the motor bus owners uh, were saying, how can we get people on the buses? You're requiring that. Um, we just can't do that. And my point of view was, look at once the law is passed, there will be people that will want to uh, come up with inventions to make the buses accessible. And we had a huge fight on that, and they were one of the ones that uh, fought it the most. And uh, just a quick sidebar that in the Transportation Committee in the House, uh, we won uh, that, that position by a 21 to 20 vote. So it was really a tough thing. But what we did is that we gave the motor bus owners, uh, I think it was 15 or 20 years to, to uh, be accessible. And in the meantime, uh, the uh, inventions came up so that today your buses will bow and scrape and dance and do everything to lower the entrance level so that people in wheelchairs or uh, people uh, sight impaired or the elderly or so forth can get on the bus with no trouble at all. So that was one of our biggest fights in getting things through. But in the House, what we did is that the leadership was trying to kill the legislation. So they assigned it to uh, five or seven different committees. I re don't recall specifically right now, but also about 12 different subcommittees. And so what we did was we strategized and we went to the subcommittee that would be the most favorable. And that was part of education and labor. And Major Owens was the chairman of that subcommittee, a gentleman from New York, and he was very, very positive about what we were trying to do. And so it got out of there, then it went to the full committee, and then we went to the next committee. And we then built up to transportation being the last one because we knew of the fight that was going on. So strategically, we were very careful. On the Senate side, because of, of the leadership they had over there, it was not as difficult as it was in the House to get the legislation through. 
let me let me ask you a little bit more about the ADA. You're 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 listed often as the primary author, and you know this is a law firm, and you're a client of law firm as well. Um, what was it like drafting legislation like that? What what did you draw on to do that? Um, you know, not many not many get a chance to draft landmark civil rights legislation. Can you talk a little bit about that? What sure. parts of your life you drew on, and what or, just what it's like generally? No problem. Uh, President Reagan was in office at the time, and he there was a group that was devoted to disabilities, and uh, it's still there. And but basically during that period of time, the uh, chair and the vice chair, uh, a woman from Connecticut was the chair, and a woman from Colorado was the vice chair. Uh, the woman from Colorado, Roxanne Vieira, uh, her husband was a very close friend of mine. And so she and uh, the other, the chair of the committee uh, came to see me one day and they said, we understand that you're working on uh, some legislation in regards and disabilities. We are also uh, working on it and we'd love to work with you. And I agreed. And so we started the whole process. And on the Senate side, uh, we got uh, 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 Senator Weicker from Connecticut as the Senate sponsor. And uh, so we worked on legislation. He then got defeated in the next campaign. And so then uh, we got uh, the other senators that I discussed to put in the legislation. At that particular time, I didn't realize that there was a grassroots movement across the country of people with disabilities wanting to do something uh, in regards to our civil rights. And so then in January, I started working with this group and basically we put in the legislation as modified then in April of that year. And the, then we got it through. But it was it was uh, negotiations, um, not only in the House and so House of Representatives, but also in the Senate and in the White House. Um, we uh, basically worked with the White House to get the legislation in a position that the administration could support. And we, uh, as I said earlier, Dick was very involved, Dick Thornburg was very involved in that whole effort. Uh, but we went back and forth and it was aggressive. Um, but the good news is, is that the president of the United States, George H.W. Uh, Bush, was one of our biggest supporters. He had a daughter who died of a disability at a very young age. And he and Barbara were committed to doing something in regards to disability rights. So uh, he basically was there wanting to get it done, promised me personally that he would be supportive of it, even though there were members of his cabinet and others who were totally opposed. So it was that type of effort going back and forth uh, that we finally got it through. Wow. Well, let me let me ask you this. You know, we're here for International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Right. It's obviously a worldwide um, day, worldwide observance. Now, the ADA was 32 years ago. Uh, could, could you talk a little bit about the impact the ADA had on disability inclusion throughout the world and, and you know, leading to having an International Day of Persons with Disabilities uh, recognized by the United Nations? And also, in, in talking about that, where does the U.S. stack up today? Or have we kept pace with other countries? Are we ahead of them as we were in the in 1990? Well, I think, Craig, we need to understand that we as a nation uh, really uh, are responsible for the whole dis disability rights movement. And we've been aggressive on regards to that. And the UN has been very supportive of, of that. Many people testify before the UN trying to get support there and so on. So when we adopted the ADA, it became a big issue at the UN, and and uh, we got support from most nations uh, and so forth. When it came up for uh, a decision to be uh, confirmed by the United States, uh, President uh, uh, George W. Bush, son of, uh, basically approved it so that the process would keep moving along. And then we had to certify it. Um, and that would take a two-thirds vote of the United States Senate. And uh, Bob Dole was now out of the Senate, and uh, he was uh, in a wheelchair at that point. And so he and his wife, who was also an ex-senator, 
um, basically were on the Senate floor. And as this, legis this legislation was uh, coming to the floor, and we had the votes. I was very involved with Bob in trying to get the votes uh, for the treaty. Uh, we had the votes. And, and during that uh, time, and I'm going to be very direct politically in regards to what happened here. Um, so that day of the vote, the Republicans and the Democrats in the Senate each had individual luncheons. And at that luncheon, uh, uh, Senator from Texas uh, had just been elected. And uh, he went to this luncheon and he talked about uh, the treaty being on the floor that day. And he said that if it was adopted, that the UN could take away your disabled child from your from the family. Totally not true, uh, but uh, he basically pushed that. They then left that luncheon and the treaty was on the Senate floor at the time. And uh, they came to the floor and when the vote occurred, Bob and, and his wife were on the floor and uh, we started going through the, the uh, list of members and voting. And Bob is from Kansas, of course, was from Kansas. And uh, the two Kansas members uh, voted against it. And they had committed to Bob that they were supportive. And we lost it by two votes. Um, today, we are still not a co-signer of that treaty. And there are only uh, three countries in the world that aren't. Um, it's a sad thing because we're the ones that basically push this movement. We're the ones that we have the law in our country, and it's been established by over 50 different countries as a variation of our ADA. And so yet we've done all this, but we're still not co-signer of the treaty. That's sad, uh, but it is a fact. It is very sad. The we do celebrate the day, though, and so the the uh, could you talk a little bit about the ADA's impact on other countries? Have so are you saying then that the the movement to do International Day of Persons with Disabilities came directly from the ADA, or was it? Yes. That, have yes. other countries adopted similar legislation? They've adopted similar legislation, not all of it as strong as ours, of course, but uh, but they have, and that's great. You know, is is. Some of your uh, partners and and maybe some of your clients, as they travel internationally, they will notice that the uh, uh, that the facilities and so forth are not accessible as they are in the United States. And and uh, as a matter of fact, some of the issues here is that a lot of companies, when they're trying to promote somebody to go into a different country to head up their office and so forth, a lot of those folks have not been able to take the job because a family member has a disability and it isn't accessible and so they can't take it. So a lot of improvement needs to be made across the world in regards to disabilities. But to a great extent, uh, the, we in the United States, uh, as we're the promoters of it, the aggressors of it, and yet we didn't sign the treaty. So we're kind of in a tough spot to advocate strongly uh, in regards to disability rights. But we do, and, and it's very refreshing to see uh, uh, what different countries are doing in regards to uh, making sure that the individuals of their country uh, have their basic rights in regards to disability inclusion. You know, you know, my daughter is autistic and she often uses a wheelchair. And I have to tell you, I noticed that when we went abroad in 2015, it was much harder to get around uh, with my daughter because of that um, situation. So the, and there was not as much accessibility where we went. So the, and even in the United States, you know, you're, there's still times when you have older buildings or situations where it's hard to access uh, for a wheelchair user, for example. Um, but let me ask you this too, though. You know, you know, one thing that's very interesting about accessibility standards over the past 30 years is when you're designing a building now, there are a lot of standards that are in place for uh, uh, accessible parking, accessible doors, uh, you know, the width of uh, doorways, all, all sorts of different types of regulations. At the same time, 
in the area of neurodiversity, like for my daughter who's autistic, there's not much in the way of regulations in terms of how to fully include people who may not have a physical disability, but have uh, either a non-apparent disability, a psychiatric disability, um, who have autism, or a variety of other disabilities. Uh, where do you see the country going in that area? And could you talk a little bit about neurodiversity? Sure. Um, th the first thing to do is that we adopted the ADA in 1990, as you know. Um, and all of your, most of your folks here, I assume, are lawyers. And you know that when a bill is uh, signed into law, it takes about 10 years for it to get up to the Supreme Court uh, and the challenges of it. And so sure enough, uh, there were challenges to the ADA. And, uh, and so it went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled that the ADA only covered physical disabilities. And, and so if you think back at that particular time, so that would have been around 2000, that most of the Supreme Court was made up of older individuals and they looked at disabilities as physical disabilities. They didn't look at it at intellectual or, or hidden disabilities like I have. I have epilepsy and I still have seizures as I uh, indicated. I've had seizures for 64 years, but the, the Supreme Court ruled against us. And so what we had to do is we had to go back to the Congress and try to overrule the Supreme Court, which most of you folks know how tough that is. But we introduced legislation to include all disabilities. Um, and so the ADA Amendments Act uh, was adopted. Now, it passed the House and Senate quickly. Um, we had no trouble with that. And it was uh, President H.W. Bush had signed the ADA. And when the Amendments Act went to, be the, went to the White House, it was President George W. Bush who signed the ADA Amendments Act. So the Bush family has been totally engaged and involved in the whole disability movement. But as a result of the ADA Amendments Act, it covers all disabilities. Now, uh, one thing that uh, I have felt strongly about is that the internet, uh, there's a question of whether or not the ADA covers the internet. I feel strongly that it does. And some courts have ruled that it does. Other courts have ruled that it doesn't. And so ultimately uh, it uh, went to the Supreme Court um, and the Supreme Court basically said that they agreed with the appellate court that the internet was covered by the ADA. However, other courts have uh, gone the opposite way. And so this is still open. So what is happening now is that uh, the Justice Department, the health uh, agency and the education agency are all working on rules and regs to say that the ADA does cover the internet. And those rules and regs hopefully will be uh, completed by the end of 23. Um, and, and then also Senator Duckworth has introduced legislation to clarify that, to make sure it's, it, it is, internet is covered. Think about it, during the whole pandemic, uh, so-called able-bodied individuals were able to use the internet to do finances, to do shopping, to do whatever. Uh, and those of us with disabilities, if you didn't have an ability to handle a computer or, or the internet in any other way, uh, you were restricted from participating. And so it's critical that we get this, uh, get this done. We're working on it now. I'm very active in it and we will succeed. We'll get it done. And uh, consequently, then all of us with disabilities will be able to have access to the internet. In regards to your specific question, Craig, uh, we have to just fight on that, that type of stuff to make sure that everybody with disability is included in regards to the rights that have been provided. Well, like, you know, one thing I've seen with my daughter is at uh, like movie theaters now and theaters generally, they'll often have sensory friendly um, right. showings, which is, which is great for her because she can go and enjoy the movie. There's not really any regulations on that. And, you know, it's more a best practice at this point, but you know, there's a lot of best practices like that, that, that companies can do, can do. Uh, one thing I want to talk to you a little bit about was the principle of universal design, which I know is a more recent sort of development, but it's the idea that 
you know, you bring in accessibility right at the beginning when you're planning something so that, you know, someone doesn't need to necessarily request an accommodation that when you, um, for example, with uh, today's program, if anyone wants to get captioning, you can go, there's a CC, a closed captioning button on the lower left side, and you can see uh, real-time captioning. So uh, it, you don't need to request it as an accommodation. And for those who may not have a disability, but where captioning would be useful, they can use captioning as well. Can you talk a little bit about universal design? Yeah, let me just take captioning, for instance. Uh, it is in place, of course, for those of us with disabilities. But if you go into a sports bar, uh, you don't have the volume up on the TV. What you do is have captioning. So in regards to captioning, that's something that's an accommodation for everybody, not just uh, people who need it because of their disability. Well, that's true also in curb cuts. If you uh, you see a curb cut someplace, and who uses that? If you watch and, and so forth, you'll see that, yeah, people in wheelchairs use it, people that uh, uh, are sight impaired uh, use it, the elderly use it, but also delivery men and women who are taking goods to the stores on that block use it. Um, young kids with their rollerblades and bicycles and so forth use it, unfortunately. But but it becomes an accommodation for everybody. It's the same thing in regards to if you go to airports uh, and you want to use the phone, there's a volume control on it. Uh, that's for people who are hearing impaired, but everybody uses it. And so in regards to accommodations, I'll go right back to uh, facilities. Um, if you are building a facility, uh, you have to include it uh, in your design stage. Um, if you are uh, remodeling a facility, you have to make sure that that facility now, if you remodeled it, is accessible. Uh, if it's an existing building that's been in, in for uh, X number of years, you aren't required to modify it. So uh, we've been very careful uh, to try to be fair uh, over the years, but I feel very strongly that those of us with disabilities need to participate in everyday life just like anybody else. I quickly will divert and say that um, in the last five presidents, except for one, um, I have said to them that, look at those of us with disabilities want a job and we want to pay taxes. I don't know any other group in America who wants to pay taxes. We do. And the reason we do is because that means that we have a job. That means that we can provide for our family just like anybody else. We can own a home or rent a home. We can get a car and so forth. So uh, a job, which I assume you'll go to at some point, is critical for those of us with disabilities just like anybody else. And the employment rate is sad, but we can talk about that when you're ready. Let's talk about it now. So the the right after the ADA, as you mentioned, there was a surge in disability employment as more people entered the workforce because they could get accommodations and things like that. And it, and it was a statement by the United States government that uh, people with disabilities should be included in the workplace. And there was a response to that. But, you know, over the course of the last 30 years, the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities plateaued at between 20 and 25 percent compared to about 60 to 65 percent for the general population. And um, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities has typically been double the general unemployment rate. So what else can we do to try to further facilitate people with disabilities entering the workforce? Well, I happen to think that uh, in corporations, for instance, that you have to go to the CEO. And the reason you have to go there is you've got it. The CEO has to tell the HR department and others that they want to hire people with disabilities. And I'm very involved with that. Uh, there's a group called Bender Consulting from Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm uh, the pro bono chair of their board to get companies to hire people with disabilities. And the Bender Group has thousands of people with disabilities in their database and they uh, get people employed with federal agencies. For national security agency that you have to have clearance, uh, security clearance, we have 200 people per year get hired uh, by them. But then 
uh, corporations, if they tell their HR people that they want to hire, you can do it. So we've made progress there. Um, I think the, the thing is, is for, for us to recognize that you said a moment ago, Craig, in regards to your uh, involvement in the Labor Department, is that uh, I met with uh, uh, the President Obama at the time and Valerie Jarrett, who you know, um, and, and basically my point was that the Federal Contractors Act, that for years we've been trying to put something through that in effect require federal contractors and federal subcontractors to hire people with disabilities. And we tried and tried and were unsuccessful until uh, President Obama was in in the second term. And we met with Valerie and, and we basically, the president said, why not? Let's do it. So the, the executive order was uh, signed. Um, but as you know, it basically is an aspiration. It's 7%. It's not, not a, a, a absolute quota. In effect, it's 7%. And basically, only about 3% uh, have been employed through that. But I would say that in the first year, um, I was very involved in trying to make this happen, as you know. But in the first year, I was told by the Department of Labor that 464,000 people had been hired as a result of the executive order and the Federal Contractors Act. So it's there. Now, I don't think that's enough, to be blunt is that I think that when somebody bids for a federal contract, uh, they have to commit to hire people with disabilities. But I think we need to know, have they been hiring people in the past? And if they haven't, they're probably not going to now. So that should be something. The second thing that should happen, and I'm pushing these things, by the way, and the second thing that should happen is that when you get through with your federal contract, you need to tell us, how many people you hired and what did you go through to get people hired and so forth. So that we know that aspirationally you tried to get 7%, whatever. But I think there needs to be a requirement on entry to getting the, the contract and then on exit of what you did. That is not done today, but that's something that we're pushing and hopefully we could get it done at some point. But uh, so that's the whole thing and in regards to the effort we're putting forth. Uh, we'd like to do more, um, but I, I, I don't think that there's much more we could do except trying to get corporations to do it on their own. And the reason I tell people that is that I think businesses need to understand uh, that those of us with disabilities want a job, as I've said. And we're willing to work our butts off to make sure that we succeed at the job. And we're there every day, we're there on time and so forth, because that job means so much to us. And so if corporations and others, uh, law firms, I might say, and others uh, hire people with disabilities, they'll find that those employees are probably some of their best employees. You know, just to put that in context a little bit, um, for, for everyone on the uh, on today's uh, session, you know, about 20 to 25 percent of the population in the United States has a disability. And probably at some point in everyone's life, you'll have at least a temporary disability or a permanent one. So the, you know, it, because if you look at the list of what are what is a disability and um, the Department of Labor has actually been expanding that list for federal contractors for self ID, there's a lot of things on that list that people might not traditionally think of as disabilities, but are conditions that impact a major life process of theirs and would be considered disability, even if they don't get an accommodation. So, you know, the 7% rate is really not that high when you're thinking of 20 to 25% of people with disabilities. And yet, my experience was the same as yours, Tony. When I was at the Department of Labor, I saw most companies were at 3 to 4%, not at the 7 So, I, I want to ask you something about that. You know, um, there's been a real tremendous movement, and in my practice, I, I advise companies on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility programs. There's been a real movement over the past couple of years by companies to have diversity programs, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, to make that a prominent part of their corporate culture. Um, but often, uh, and I just saw a study that said this, and I've seen this number uh, floated in a number of different contexts, um, only about 5% 
of DEI programs include people with disabilities. They're largely focused, as they should be, on race and gender discrimination and on combating that and increasing opportunities for underrepresented groups. But they often leave out uh, people with disabilities. Sometimes they leave out LGBTQ plus individuals as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about trying to expand DEI? What, what should, we have a lot of companies on the line. Uh, what can companies do to make sure they're fully including uh, all protected groups and including people with disabilities? Well, let me let me be honest about something. You know, uh, the stigma that I talked about early in our comments uh, is something that exists uh, in our society today. Uh, people assume because of my disability uh, that I can't do X. And I acknowledge there are things I can't do because of my disability. I can't fly an airplane. I can't drive a police car. I can't drive a fire engine and so forth. Um, I understand all those. But, you know, there are things I can do better than a lot of other people. And so the stigma that exists is an issue. And the reason I bring that up is that when we talk about the number of people employed who have disabilities, we're not including people who do who won't disclose. Um, a lot of people won't disclose their disability because they're afraid of being fired. They're afraid of being discriminated against. They're afraid of not being able to advance in their employment because of their uh, knowledge of disability. And I am aggressive in, in talking about my disability and encouraging people to uh, self-disclose because I think that would create an impression among the general populace, but in your business and so forth, that look at, you're very able to be able to do whatever it is. Some CEOs have disabilities and have disclosed, others have not, but the stigma that, that goes along with those of us with disabilities is something that we have to fight and we have to change. Because I think that two or 3% number is much greater than that if people disclose their disability. I have been very involved in, in, in the political effort in different political groups um, where they don't hire people with disabilities, quote, unquote. But after pressing them, they realize that they have people with disabilities, but people are afraid to disclose. And so we have to get through this, this stigma that I keep talking about in order for people to feel like they can uh, let people know exactly what is going on in their life, uh, but you can't today. For example, that is a problem. Stigma is a problem, of course, with, with the gay community and that a lot of people don't disclose uh, of, of their life and so forth. But it used to be a problem uh, in other communities as well, but we've made great progress in regards to people of color. We've made great progress in regards to women. Uh, we are making progress in regards to uh, gays, et cetera, but we haven't made the progress openly in regards to people with disabilities. And I like to stress that openness because I, I want to acknowledge that a lot of us with disabilities are working, but we don't disclose and the company doesn't know that we have a disability. Yes, you know, the that was one of the biggest challenges I saw as OCCP director was getting companies to really embrace self-identification. What I often saw were that companies would 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 comply. They would do basic legal compliance. So they'd send out the form saying, hey, here's some uh, disabilities. If you have one, please self-identify. We'll keep this confidential, you know, but they didn't really tie it to a campaign saying that it's perfectly fine to have a disability in the workforce. In fact, if you have a disability, we would love to give you an accommodation to help you be more productive, um, whatever you need. And, and by the way, we also have a disability employee resource group. And you know we're fully committed to the full inclusion of people with disabilities. I will tell you, and this is from my personal experience when I was the director of OFCCP, companies that did that tended to have much higher rates. Yeah. I met one company that, that they did all those things and they had a 14% self ID rate. So part of that was probably people were going to that company who had disabilities because they knew they would be treated with respect. But I'm sure part of that was also people self identifying. Yes, who, who might not have disclosed because of concerns about stigma. That's exactly right. I mean, but you know, let's be honest, not just corporations, but let's take universities. How many universities are accessible? 
How many universities encourage even students with disability to go to their universities? So we have a problem in the education area in regards to disabilities as well. The one thing I'm excited about is that uh, Christine Clark, who is the Deputy uh, Attorney General for Civil Rights, she's really aggressively enforcing the ADA in regards to everybody. And it's exciting to watch that happen because I take the view that when you're voting, if you have a disability in particular, but if, when you're voting for office, make sure you vote for a president who believes in disability rights because that president appoints the attorney general who has to enforce the ADA. That attorney general uh, selects the assistant, assistant attorney general for, for civil rights that enforces the ADA. So when you're voting, if you particularly if you have a disability, you have a family member with disability, make sure that you know uh, when you vote that that individual supports disability rights. And so I, I, I think that the ADA covers a lot of areas, Craig, that the government hasn't enforced the ADA. And, uh, and going through the 30 years, I've been involved uh, with all these different administrations in trying to get enforcement done. And I would say that with this administration um, and the last administration, the Obama administration, uh, they were aggressive in regards to that. Valerie Jarrett was a big help, as I indicated previously. And now the current administration, uh, Joe Biden and his people are aggressively, as I've just said, with the Department of Justice. But look at the President of the United States has a disability um, and he has a speech impairment. And, and so uh, all of a sudden people realize that you can be President of the United States with a disability. And we've had other presidents with disabilities, but they wouldn't disclose. And as a matter of fact, when Franklin Roosevelt in, in a wheelchair because of his disability, the media was not permitted to take a picture of him in his wheelchair. And, and so all those things have gone on over the years, but I'm excited about uh, what the Biden administration is doing because he's right now the symbol for us in our disability community of things that we can do. He can be the most influential individual uh, in the United States, but also throughout the world. Uh, and he has a disability and is doing a great job. You know, if I, if I may add something about FDR, you know, at the FDR Memorial, they added a um, yes, a, a statue of him uh, in a wheelchair. After the fact, by the way. After the fact. Yeah. I tell you, when I go there, I often see people around it taking photos with him. And I, not to not to get emotional, but I brought my daughter there, you know, in the wheelchair and, and photo with her. And I think that representation yeah. is so critical. And he's one of the greatest presidents we've had in this country. He had a disability, he was in a wheelchair. And he felt like he couldn't talk about it right. because of the stigma that existed at the time. I'm sure he would today. So the the uh, you know that 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 it, there's a symbolic aspect to it, but it's extremely practically important. I could tell you I've seen that in my own life as well. But I look at Senator Duckworth. Uh, here's an individual, as United States Senator. Um, she has a disability. She lost both her legs um, in in combat. And and look at what she's done. What look and when when uh, the Biden administration was pursuing people for cabinet post, she was in line for Secretary of Defense. Uh, she it was close uh, to her getting that. She would have been a great Secretary of Defense in my view. Uh, and she's a veteran uh, with a disability and so forth. She's doing a tremendous job in the United States Senate. I like her there. But but the point is is that today we look at people with disabilities for their ability as opposed to concentrating on their disability. And that stigma is what I'm aggressively trying to get us to recognize and get rid of it. So, you know, we're nearing the end of today's session. I, um, you know, we've talked about what, what businesses can do, what organizations can do. Uh, one thing I like to often mention is, you know, because so few DEI programs include disability, maybe take a look at the president's executive order. He issued a DEIA executive order, President Biden, and he expressly included disability and accessibility. 
And, uh, you know, one thing I, I, I was recently on a panel with the Chief Accessibility Officer of Canada, uh, Stephanie Cadu, uh, very impressive person. And I just loved it that Canada had a Chief Accessibility Officer that reported to the Prime Minister. And I, I've been trying to encourage that in the United States, we should have a Chief Accessibility Officer that reports to the President. You mentioned the importance of the CEO. Could you talk a little bit about Chief Accessibility Officers and also what can we do as businesses, as organizations to uh, improve the situation for people with disabilities beyond what the ADA has done and to truly get uh, full inclusion in the United States. I was advocating with the Biden administration that we have uh, somebody uh, with a disability report directly to the president as to what is going on. Uh, the compromise, which I really like, is that we have put uh, someone with a disability, or we've included, I should say, someone with a disability on the Domestic Policy Council. Now, the Domestic Policy Council, every piece of legislation, executive order regarding domestic policy goes through this council. And now, for the first time, we have somebody with a disability as part of that. Now, the significance there is not only uh, advocating disability rights, but if something goes through that's a labor issue or a defense issue, that person on that console now can raise, what are you doing in regards to disabilities and so forth? And they have a vote on everything there. So all of a sudden we're now in a position with an accessibility officer in effect at the domestic policy console. And I'm really excited about it. It's the first time that it's ever happened. And, uh, and, it's a it's a very important thing in regards to uh, uh, the accessibility officer for companies. I really aggressively support that. Is that um, you should have somebody who reports to the CEO uh, that is responsible for disability uh, accessibility uh, in your company. It's also true in regards to employment. Uh, that person should be advocating for people with disabilities to be employed. That's, I think, critical for every company. I'm on several corporate boards, uh, four of them, uh, and I'm a big advocate of that on the boards that I'm on. And it works. I, I found it works, too. When I was a local government attorney, you know, one issue that would come up sometimes with local governments and public accommodations would be that you would... Um, they would build something in a park and it wouldn't be accessible and then they would remove it because, mm -hmm. oh, they, they didn't think about people with disabilities. And I always would think to myself, well, why didn't they design it for people with disabilities to begin with? And, you know, it's like not only are you showing that you didn't think about it, but then you're taking that away from the whole community. Why not make it accessible for the whole community? And, you know, that's where the chief accessibility officer can really help because you can be that that's really universal design because you could be thinking about it from the beginning when you're designing a project. You have someone sign off on the disability and accessibility components. And uh, I, I think that's wonderful that you were able to get the U.S. government to have uh, someone on the uh, Domestic Policy Council. And if President Biden's listening, think about a chief accessibility officer as well. So, <laughs> I'd be all for that. <laughs> I know you would. I know you would. That's why I use this opportunity to say that. By the so, way, in regards to parks, uh, there are uh, equipment for the parks now that are totally accessible. Yes. And so there are. if if a, a city or whatever wants to put together a park, they should include the equipment that makes everything accessible for uh, those of us with disabilities. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, so the final question, Tony. First, I just want to tell you, it's been a true honor and privilege to speak with you today. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much for 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 this opportunity. Uh, we had a, a huge audience and, uh, you know, I know this is part of your personal ministry. I wanted to give you a chance to, you know, for all those who are listening, what can we do? What can be done? What, what, what should we take from your ministry and from all the work of the many people you mentioned on both sides of the aisle who contributed to the ADA? What can we do to, as best practices, as parts of our own personal ministries to improve and basically improve and, and make more accessible this country for people with disabilities? I think to start off with is to recognize stigma, uh, to recognize hate, to recognize all those things that take place, not only for those of us with disabilities, but for everything else. 
is that we need to want to be inclusive, inclusive in your family, inclusive in your business, inclusive in your church, inclusive wherever you are to make sure that those of us with disabilities are given an opportunity. Because I say to you, you indicated earlier that practically everybody is going to be impacted by disability, either themselves or a family member uh, going through life. And so those of us who reach out to make sure that people with disabilities are included are, in my view, the angels of God. Well, let's end it with that. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful speaking with you today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good day.